ready when you're ready. Good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Am I good, Greg? Am I coming through? I don't know. Well, testing one, two, check one. Two. Oh, there I am. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Uh, we're going to begin with some worship. Uh, so if you would stand, please, for this first song. Those that are already standing are far ahead of the curve. Um,
the Lord. Good to see you all. God bless you. Glad you're able to be with us this morning. Welcome to worship. Hey, a couple of things. You got to insert in your bulletin there. It's changed a little bit. We had such a fantastic turnout last Sunday night. It was amazing. We had adults show up, and within 40 minutes, they'd packed a thousand bags. It was incredible. Amazing what happens when God's people show up and work together. Thank you all that came for that. So we're not meeting tonight, but next Sunday night we'll bump up our schedule. So if you're planning on helping us physically distribute our Easter outreach bags in the month of March, we need you to show up next Sunday night so we can see how many people we've got and then we'll divide that number by four and make our assignments for those weekends in March. And then if we need another night, we got the 25th on top of it. So if you're planning on physically helping us distribute our Easter outreach bags, next Sunday night at six, if you could be here, that would be great. And if you're planning on helping us, but for some reason you can't be here, just let me know so we can put you on the list and as we um, divide up our different teams for that. So I wanted to throw that out there and just again thank everybody that came last week and helped us out. I really appreciate that very, 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 very much. Be in prayer for that outreach. Uh, we're praying that these Easter outreach bags will be used to uh, draw people to Christ, get them back to church, get them where God needs them them to be so be praying about that that hearts will be open homes will be open and God will do a great work through that as he's promised if we'll do what he tells us to do father thank you so much for each person that's here we thank you for the breakfast we've already had we appreciate Larry's Sunday school class working to get that done and everybody that came and it's always good to have a time just to be together in fellowship we thank you for everybody again that came last Sunday night to help us put the bags together and for all the uh, enthusiasm and encouragement that we gave to each other. Help us as we move towards the month of March and we think about Easter coming up and people that need to know Jesus or need to, to get back to walking with him like maybe they once did. And we pray that you just use this effort to glorify yourself. We thank you that uh, our sins are forgiven through him, and we have hope because of the resurrection. And we pray, Lord, as we continue to seek your face, as we move farther into this new year, which is getting older now, uh, halfway through February almost, it goes by fast. And yet we have all kinds of opportunities to share the gospel of Christ, to minister to others, to pray for one another, and to serve you. We just thank you, Father, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
not ever be My name will not be found In halls of history There'll be no marble plaque To tell of my good deeds There'll be no great parades honor me but there's a record book my name is written in it was recorded there when I was born again no one can blot it out it seems If you have your Bible, I encourage you to turn to the book of 1 John, chapter 3. You've been tracking with us since the first of the year. Our theme is a little more like Jesus and a little less like me. And we're in the third chapter this morning. We've talked about this whole concept of becoming more and more like our Savior, Jesus Christ, but we've also been very honest to follow what John tells us and that anyone who truly seeks to become more like the Lord will have to deal with opposition. And it sometimes shocks us, the opposition we get when we truly purpose in our heart to become a little more like Jesus. We call these enemies, we looked at three of these enemies. Let's do a quick review. Enemy number one, who remembers? Sin. Sin. That's our internal enemy. Like I said many times, the biggest problem in my life is the man in the mirror. You know, that's my big challenge. And I often say, and I look at that guy looking back at me, Lord help. <laughs> First John 1 John 1.9 tells us if we confess our sins, what? He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So 1 John 1, 9 was a verse we used specifically aimed at this internal enemy, the sin nature that still besets even the saved sinner. Enemy number two was a what? World system. That's our external enemy. We're living in a fallen world system. 
And many times it seeks to oppose us, to come against us and hinder our quest for Christ's likeness. So to that, 1 John 2.15, John says, don't love the world. Neither the things that are in the world, for all that is in the world is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And then enemy number three last week was Satan. Satan's our eternal enemy, 1 John 2.28. Now little children, abide in him. That when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So sin, the internal enemy, the world system, the external enemy, Satan, the eternal enemy, all those things are working against us. But as we know, Jesus is greater than these things. We'll get to that in 1 John chapter 4 where he says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. But there's one more enemy that I want to surface that um, is implicit in John's writing and in John's life uh, and painfully present in the experience of anyone who truly seeks to grow in Christ's likeness, who wants to develop their discipleship, who wants to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And that enemy is suffering. If sin is our internal enemy and the system of the world is our external enemy and Satan is our eternal enemy, sin is the universal enemy. There's an old Spanish proverb that says, cada hogar tiene su silencio. Every home has its hush. Everyone you meet is going through something. Suffering, difficulty, hinders us as we seek to become more like Christ. And the universal enemy of suffering motivates the universal question of every person who's ever lived. And that question is, of course, why? Why? Why this? Why that? Why her? Why him? Why now? Why, why, why? Even Jesus asked why. From the cross, he said, my God, my God, why? Why? And so suffering, John was familiar with it. All the disciples were. You read Christian history, biography, and in this particular sanctuary this morning, many of us identify with this thing called suffering. Now, the Bible takes suffering and puts it in three basic categories. Number one, persecution. Persecution. In the Sermon on the Mount, no fine print on the contract to follow Jesus. He's right up front. He says, those who follow me will face persecution. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. For righteousness. Now in America, we don't experience much persecution, at least not at this time. But in other countries and other cultures, people are suffering in deplorable ways to name the name of Christ, to gather like we do so freely to worship and to have a Bible and to, to grow. There's constant persecution. There's uh, oppression and there's physical depravity and there's different things that go on. John had just come off a place called Patmos, an island where he'd been exiled. He received the book of Revelation there. It's a, a rocky place. It's a barren place. And then he was sent back to Ephesus where he lived out the remaining few years of his life, lived well into his 90s. He experienced other forms of persecution that I won't go into because they're despicable to talk about. But if you study Fox's book of martyrs or some other traditional histor historical Christian books, you can see that all throughout history, Christians have faced at different times varying degrees of persecution. I think even today of the Gaza conflict, we think about Israel and our support of Israel. We think of the Palestinians and the oppression of Hamas. But right smack dab in the middle are people who are Christians. They're Egyptians. Some are Palestinians, some are Israelis, some are Arabs, and to them, what they're going through is persecution. We don't often hear them talked about on Fox News or CNN, 
but they're very real people who have believed in Jesus just like we have. And if they're caught in the crossfires of the conflict and the geopolitical meanderings that will follow over there, they're experiencing persecution today. So persecution, number one. Number two, a second category of suffering that opposes us as we seek to become more like Jesus is one we're much more familiar with, and it is pain, pain, physical pain, joint pain, nerve pain, bodily pain, aches and pains. It's intrusive, it's invasive, it's chronic, it's crippling, it's incurable, it's untreatable, it's sometimes unmanageable and unimaginable. The pain that these bodies go through and have to deal with on a daily basis. I was in my early 20s when I first heard of a, a lady named Johnny Erickson Tata. If you've never heard of Johnny, you should look her up. It's spelled J-O-N-I. In 1967, as a 17-year-old teenager living outside of Baltimore, Maryland, she dove into Chesapeake Bay into a water that was too shallow and instantly became a quadriplegic. She spent all of her life in that condition. And if you read her story called Johnny, or if you're familiar with her ministry called Johnny and Friends, that brings hope to people who have disabilities, hopes to people who have challenges, you will be greatly encouraged by her life. Her honesty, her sincerity, and her willingness to pursue a relationship with Jesus Christ, to live every day to the fullest that she can with her severe limitations will be a challenge to you. She's also a two-time cancer survivor on top of everything else. And uh, if you don't know about Johnny, I would have you look that up. But she's a testimony to what someone can do in following Christ in spite of pain, in spite of difficulty. And I know many of you face pains today. Many of you have challenges today. There are people not present in this congregation today who deal with physical difficulties and the, the, the hindrance that that brings and the wear and the grind that it brings to a body that has a spirit and a soul that wants to be like Jesus but has a hard time meeting the bell every time the bell rings because of the pain that the body has incurred through years of living. Then there's a third area. Let's just call it problems or pressures. It's kind of a broad area. We think about the stresses of life, financial tension, the daily grind, issues at my job, aging parents, wayward children, unresolved conflict, fractured families, dysfunction, brokenness, fragmentation, divorce, death, the losses of life, shattered dreams, broken hearts, the presence of sin, the presence of the world system, the presence of Satan, the pressures, the problems. It would be so easy to not become like Jesus even though I want to. It would be so easy just to settle for less than God's best. Surely He would understand what I go through. Surely he would understand the uphill climb that I have to make every day. Surely in his grace and mercy, he would cut me some slack and not cause me to have to take up my cross every day and follow him and deny myself when myself screams, why, why, why? The problems and pressures that we face at times that seem almost insurmountable, unsolvable, and it could make us want to give up our quest for Christ-likeness. We truly want to be more like Jesus. I know we do. If I was to say this morning, everybody that wants to be like Jesus, sit on this side. And everybody that doesn't give a rip, sit on this side. This side would be full. And this side would be empty. I know that. I know that's our desire. I know many times we say, God, I want to. God, I'm willing to. God, help me to. But then we ask, why? I'm trying so hard, and it's not working out. I want it to be better, but it's not happening for me. I see other people, they're happy. They seem to be growing. They're so spiritual, and I struggle 
and I stumble and I don't know what to do. I'm confused and I'm frustrated and I don't know what to do. Why? Why do I go through this? Or why does my spouse have to go through this? Or why do my parents have to go through this? Or why do my children have to go? Why? Why? And it's that universal cry from this universal enemy that you can read every history book You can read every anthropology of every culture. You can read every sociology that exists in psychology and philosophy. And nobody's adequately answered this question called why. So what did John have to say to us here in 1 John chapter 3? How does he help us to go through even the suffering we're presently experiencing right now? How does he encourage us and challenge us in spite of our suffering to keep going? to keep becoming a little more like Jesus. Well, he makes three statements. I want you to write these down in these three verses. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. Let's read it together and then go back and pick up these three statements. Maybe this will help somebody to believe for one more day. Maybe this will help somebody here this morning to take that next step. Maybe this will help somebody to hang on a little bit longer when you feel like giving up, throwing in the towel and calling it quits, whether it's your own daily routine, whether it's your marriage, whether it's something in your family, something on your job, the suffering that you presently experience. John says three things, and I'll share them after I read this. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he, Jesus, is pure. First, John reminds us about our identity, who we are, verse one. Next, John informs us about our destiny, who we will be, that's verse two. And finally, he encourages us about our reality, that is, who we ought to be, verse 3. Our identity, who we are. Our destiny, who we'll be. Our reality, who we ought to be. Let's look at those three statements quickly before we go our way today. Verse 1, he reminds us about our identity, who we are. Notice what he says. We are the sons of God. Newer versions say children. Sons, don't take it personally, ladies. We say mankind. We mean womankind, too. The word sons in the original uh, Greek culture means heirs, the ones who would inherit. Ladies didn't have the, the, the value in the culture that ladies in America have. It was a different culture. And so all of the, the property, all of the inheritance, all that went through the males, And so sons is a legal term that means sons and daughters. We are the children of God. That's who we are. And he says we are God's children, look verse 1, because of the love. And that's where the confusion comes from, doesn't it? God loves me, and I'm going through this. God loves me, and he allowed this into my life. I say, Lord, I want to follow you and I want to become more like Jesus and you let that happen to me? God, if you love me, why didn't you stop that? God, if you love me, why didn't you answer my prayer? God, if you love me, why are you breaking my heart? And there's that that, that complex difficulty in putting those things together. If he loves me, why doesn't he protect me? If he loves me, why didn't he provide a way out of this? Why doesn't he do something if he loves me? That's our question. That's our concern. And many times we just, we just shut down. We just shut down because it's, it's stifling. It's shocking. It's stunning when we see what God allows some people to suffer through. Sometimes I think I want to trade lives with somebody till I find out about theirs. <laughs> and I feel like I'll take my own suffering. That's what I was going through 10 years ago when Sherry was diagnosed with cancer. It was uh, quite a thing. And um, for the first three months, 
after her diagnosis, all those trips to Barnes Hospital, back and forth, doctors and procedures and tests. And for three months, the only good news, the only good report we got was this. Well, it's not in her brain. That was it. Three months, and that was the only good word there was. Inoperable, untreatable. And then her right lung failed. She spent 16 days in Barnes Hospital, the first eight days in intensive care, which something I could only describe as a glorified, sanctified leaf blower on steroids, forcing air down into her airway to keep her alive. And she wasn't liking it one little bit. And then eight days in the regular room, and then for the remainder of her life, I drained a liter to a liter and a half of fluid off her lung every day. And it didn't help. It didn't help. It didn't help at all. Why? I, I don't share that to get you to feel sorry for me. I just tell you that, that preachers suffer too. People go through stuff. How do we go through stuff? How do we get through stuff? We got to remember who we are. Because when you suffer, it can hurt so bad. It can cripple your whole way of thinking about life to such a degree that you forget who you are. And when you forget who you are, you do things you would never do. And you become susceptible to sin on the inside and the world on the outside and Satan from the upside, the downside, and the backside, and every other side because you're tired and you hurt, and you say, God, I've committed my life to you, and now you did this to me? So we have to be careful and not forget who we are. Notice what he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. And some versions say, and so we are. Do anybody have a version that says that? A couple over here? Yeah. In some of the older manuscripts, it says that. And that is to emphasize that. Why? Because we need to be reminded. Sometimes we're so messed up in the head by what's going on in our house that we forget. And we think, oh, what's the big deal? And we go make another decision that's dumb, or we, or we make a choice that we'll regret, and then we've got to live with the consequences of that on top of everything else. And we get all tied up in this, this knot where we don't know what's up and what's down, and we just quit. So we've got to remember who we are. Never forget who you are. Now, when I think about this, I always remember that great story that Billy Graham always told. Billy Graham was visiting in the nursing home, and an old friend was in the nursing home, and Billy was visiting this old friend in the nursing home. And this woman in a wheelchair kept running up and, and, and saying, hello, Jimmy, hello, Jimmy. Hello, Jimmy. And for a while, Billy just sort of, you know, kind of went along. Finally, he said, ma'am, do you know who I am? She said, no, but there's a nurse right over there. If you go ask her, she'll tell you. <laughs> See, sometimes we forget who we are. And we got to be reminded. So when we come back to a verse like this, no matter how we feel about it, or what it appears to be, or what someone tells us, God says we are the children of God, the sons and the daughters of the living God, bought with a price, the precious blood of Christ on the cross. And that's why the world doesn't know us. We don't identify with them. We're no longer part of that whole system. So we've got to bring our minds back under the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm forgiven. He loves me. It rains on the just and the unjust. Everybody goes through stuff. Everybody has troubles. Everybody has trials. Everybody has tribulations. And like Chuck Swindoll said one time, when God's children get into tribulation, they got to learn how to tribulate. <laughs> and I can relate to that. And so can many of you. So he reminds us about our identity, who we are. Next, verse 2, he informs us about our destiny, who we are will be. He says, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that we, when Jesus is revealed, we'll be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
will be like Jesus because of his promises. That's the direction we're going. We're not heading in the wrong direction anymore. We're heading in the right direction. Think about it. Heaven, no sin, no sorrow, no sickness, no suffering, no pain, new body. We need one. Satan's defeated. Reunion with our loved ones. The world system is gone and Jesus ruling and reigning forever and ever and ever. That's where we're going. That's our destination. Now, if you were going on a trip, on a vacation, and you're making preparation, you'd be marking the days, getting everything ready, looking forward to that. That would guide how you're living. You say, hey, only three, three more days and I'm out of here. <laughs> only another week, I'm going to close the door and leave this job behind me for a week or two. You know, the, the expectation that we have when we understand our destiny, where we're going. And of course, many times the Bible talks about suffering in the sense of suffering for Christ's sake. Being the right kind of person on the job. Not stooping to the level of others. Learning how to be patient and wait on God to do His thing in my heart, in my mind, in a relationship be it a marriage or a friendship or a family or whatever. So our destiny uh, tells us that we're heading somewhere, a destination. And it gives us motivation to endure the present trials, difficulties. They're painful, yes. They're confusing, obviously. But there's a purpose because we know, as the old song says, by and by, when the morning comes, we'll understand it better by and by. And every once in a while, somebody will say, that's just what you preachers like to talk about. No, no, this is the truth of God. The trials, Paul would even say that his trials were momentary afflictions. Working a greater weight of glory. When we get to see Jesus, we're all going to be rewarded in some sense. And a lot of that reward will come for how did we handle suffering? How did we handle the pain? How did we handle the heartache or the heartbreak? How did we deal with those issues? Our destiny. We've all got one. What will it be like? To a very real degree, it will be revealed by how we handle this subject, this enemy called suffering. Most of our lives, you know, most of our lives kind of monotonous, you know? We go to work, we go home. Occasional this we go to, occasional that we experience. But there's not a lot of huge high points in most of our lives, or a lot of huge low points. Thank God for that. <laughs> but when they come, they will reveal what we've been doing in between. Have we really been walking with Jesus? Have we really been talking to Jesus? That'll show up. The crisis, the suffering, it won't create the character, it'll just reveal it. When I break the jar, it doesn't make the contents. It just shows you what's on the inside. And so how we suffer is very important. Number three, I'm getting to that, getting ahead of myself. Thirdly, he, he, he helps us with this enemy called suffering by challenging us, encouraging us with our reality. That's what we ought to be. Verse three, everyone who has this hope in himself, in herself, purifies himself even as Jesus is pure. Now hope, the biblical word for hope, doesn't mean maybe. Hope so. You know, like hope we make it to church on time or hope I'm not late for work tomorrow or whatever. But it's confidence in God. It's believing what God said just because God said it and because God said it, it's true in spite of what it looks like around me or what I may feel like about from time to time. Hope. So that hope of heaven, that hope of perfection, that hope of uh, moving away from the sufferings of this present day, it's that hope that purifies us. And that word's like a fire, like, like burning away the dross if you're working in metals or something like that. It, it's the idea of only the true essence of the thing is left, continues to purify, to purge out, to burn away. And that's one of the main benefits, yes, I said that. That's one of the main benefits of suffering. It burns away junk that's not good in the first place. Not all suffering, but a lot of suffering. 
exposes to us the things that we need to let go of in order to go on with God. So this hope purifies the sinner. And then secondly, this hope preaches the Savior. What I mean is, how we suffer is a sermon. Nobody wants to hear you and me preach when things are going well. When we're sitting on the top of the world, when we got the promotion at the job, on the wedding day, when the baby was born, whatever. But when we're hurting, when we're just absolutely hurting, then what do we do? How do we handle it? How do we walk with God when we can't walk at all? How do we do that? That's when the ears of people are tuned in to this Christian friend on the job or this Christian person in the family or this Christian person who lives next door. They're watching. They're listening. Because they're hurting too. and They don't know what to do. They don't have a Jesus like we do. They don't have a Savior like you do. And they're looking, they're struggling. What do I do? My life's a mess. What do I do? My kids are weird. What do I do? I hurt. Where do I go? Where do I turn? What do I do? And then it happens at your house. The phone rings. And your life is never going to be the same. It happens. And how you suffer, the hope you have when you suffer, preaches the Savior. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm almost done. Thank you for listening. I know this is an intense subject, but it has to be. Or it wouldn't be true. You may not know this, but the word Christian only appears three times in the whole Bible. In the book of Acts, it appears twice. In Acts chapter 11, verse 26, the Bible says the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. If you study the history of it, they were called Jesus followers or disciples. But it came to a point where they were so much like Jesus that they made fun of them. Little Christs. Christians. But they were wanting to become like Jesus. Like we say we want to, and I know we do. But they became so much like Christ that they just dropped all the denominational tags and they just called them Christians. <laughs> May it be so with us. May we be so much like Jesus, nobody cares what church we came from. <laughs> they just see Jesus in us, especially when we suffer. The second time the word Christian is used, it's also in the book of Acts. Apostle Paul He's talking to a man named Agrippa, trying to convince Agrippa to become a Christian. And Agrippa says, Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. He was almost persuaded, but he wasn't. Paul, the epitome of what it means to be a Christ follower, was sharing his testimony. And then the third time is here in 1 Peter. I'm going to read verse 12 through verse 19. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. I wasn't going to read this. This wasn't on my radar at all until early this morning. And as God often does, he said, Rob, somebody's going to need that today. So you read that for me. And I said, okay. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, He's blasphemed, but on your part, he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. 
Here it is, verse 16. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Kada hogar tiene su silencio. Every home has its hush. And that's why every home needs Jesus. Only Jesus can help the hurting to make sense of the suffering. The universal enemy to anyone and everyone who purposes in their heart to become a little more like Jesus. Father, help us with our suffering. A message like this invades the privacy of many people's lives. It probes, and many times where the word probes, it's painful, tender, sore. Each of us here puts our pants on one leg at a time. Each of us here hurts. Each of us here questions and wonders. Each of us here doubts and struggles. Each of us here are totally, totally dependent upon you for understanding, for strength. And Lord, when we put ourselves in the position where you place us, we find ourselves in the very best position we could ever be, not resisting your will, your purpose, and your plan, even though we're confused, even though we're sometimes distraught, even though sometimes we'd rather just walk away and disappear. You give us hope. You give us the ability in the midst of all the pain and the suffering and the difficulty to look up, to sing a song even when we're singing in the rain, to rejoice when it looks like we don't have anything to be thankful for. And when we do that, we're simply lining up with a John, with a Peter, with saints all through the ages who have faced this universal enemy called suffering and have faced it thankfully and gladly and accepted whatever suffering may come our way in order that the life of Jesus Christ may be displayed to all who have eyes to see, to all who have ears to hear. Now, Lord, I want to pray a special prayer for each person here who's really struggling today, who really thought, uh, I'm going to check out today. I'm going to start my Super Bowl party early today. I'm not going out to the church today. I just don't feel like it. And yet they, they came. They're here. Each of us has felt like that at times, and each of us has succumbed to the temptation to just not. And yet we're gathered here, Lord, as fellow strugglers, fellow travelers. Some of us are limping and wounded today. Some of us are bludgeoned and bleeding by life today. Some of us thought we had it all figured out. And right now, we can't even find it. We, what happened? Touch those hearts, Lord. Touch those minds. Encourage each one with your mercy and your grace and your love. Help them to do like the old song says, to put their hand in the nail-scarred hand. For Jesus who suffered for us, for our sins. For Jesus 
who brought salvation to sinners like us. For Jesus, who said, you're going to go through it in this world. You'll have tribulation, but I've overcome the world, and I'm never going to leave you, and I'm never going to forsake you. I'm with you all the way. Help us to turn to Him and trust in Him today with our burdens, our heavy hearts, and the pains and the problems. Help us, Lord, to lean upon Him and to lean hard and allow Him to do what only He can do in our lives and give us that joy that we all need. That John said he was writing about these things. He said, I've written to you that your joy may be full. And I think about old John, beaten and exiled and old and decrepit. And yet here he is telling young believers like us, hey, joy in the journey. There's joy for you. There's joy. Keep walking. There's joy. Keep becoming. There's joy. Keep living. There's joy, joy, joy. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, Jesus. Now let's stand together. We've got a closing song. Maybe you'd like to come to the altar and pray this morning. Maybe you'd like to bring somebody with you. Maybe you have a decision to receive the Lord. dismiss us in the grace, the mercy, and the peace of our loving Savior Jesus, who's gone before us. He knows who we are. He knows where we're at. He knows what we're going through and how we feel. Help us to trust in Him and to continue in spite of the sin and this system and Satan and suffering, these enemies. Help us to just keep on becoming a little more like Jesus today. We ask it in His name. Everybody said, Amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Have a great afternoon.